Uh, hey everyone, um, so thank you for coming today. So I know it's getting a bit late now and we're running over time, but uh, it's been great. So thanks everyone for coming along and for the speakers so far. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Azure Percept. Uh, this is me. Uh, I do lots of things, but mainly IoT consultancy. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP, uh, which is kind of feels like the natural progression from a student ambassador, really. And um, I know a few folks that have done that. And then, yeah, MVP to, to Microsoft as an FTE, as a full-time employee, happens quite often as well. Uh, so um, I'm also a Pluralsight author. And I run a few meetup groups, which I think uh, Salman's disappeared now, but that's how I met Salman and a few of the folks over there as well. Um, I run Knots IoT and .NET Knots, so in Nottingham, yeah? So, uh, yeah, the, the Knots uh, student uh, scene is something I've been quite uh, a part of for a few years now. Um, I'm also a, a STEM ambassador and a co-club organiser, mainly because I've got two little girls at home, and I want to make sure that they've got access to all this cool tech. Uh, that we've got access to. So with that, uh, I'm not going to spend ages on the slides because I want to do this part, actually. And there's loads of demos, and they might all go wrong. But that's how fun of doing live IoT demos. Uh, so this is all about the Azure Percept. Um, it's, it's made up, as far as hardware is concerned, of a carrier board, which is like the brains of the device. So that's a, a, a single board computer in there, a bit like a a Raspberry Pi, or more like a, an NVIDIA Jetson, if you've ever heard of one of those. We've also got a vision module, which is going to do the custom vision stuff that you'll have been using as part of your AI gaming challenge there, as well as a few of the other talks have used that today. Um, and then there's the audio module, which is actually what I'm going to be speaking about today. Um, uh, so we don't get many talks about the, the audio module when you see the Percept stuff, so I quite like this. Uh, something a bit different. Uh, this carrier board, I'm not going to deep dive into these specs, uh, but it uses something called Microsoft Azure IoT Edge, uh, which is Microsoft's way of being able to connect devices at the edge, as it's called. So we have a device which is close to your hardware, and then that can communicate with sensors and devices that are close to it for speed, and also for, for data processing efficiency. And then that connects up to a Microsoft IoT hub in the cloud, and then onwards to the rest of the Azure services after that. Uh, the interesting thing is actually it's using um, Microsoft's own distro of Linux, Mariner, which a lot of people don't know exists, actually. Uh, but that's what's living on this board down there. Uh, and it's using Percept Studio as the, the, uh, the, 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 the portal into the rest of the Azure services. Uh, the, the vision module, which I'll show, but I'll not spend a whole heap of time on, uh, that's using custom vision, so it's capturing images and video and then sending that up to Azure for processing. And then the sound module, which I will be using with a bunch of microphones on it, uh, and that's using the speech services like Lewis up in the uh, Azure up there. Uh, and then the components in the cloud, we've got IoT Edge, not really in the cloud, but controlled from the IoT hub. So that sits in the middle of all of this. For the speech side, we use speech services and speech studio. So some of the speech services you'd be using are things like Lewis, which is the language understanding intelligence service. And it's all about converting what we're saying. And you saw that with those captions that Salman had at the start into written word. But it goes the other way as well. So we can convert written word into speech as well. Uh, and it's all about grabbing the intent of what it is you're saying and converting it into something you can then use. And then on the vision side, we use something called custom vision uh, to be able to take uh, the images and then determine what's in them. So, demos. I told you I wasn't going to spend long on the slides. I come across here. This is actually the Percept. So, obviously, you can see it here, but you're sitting down. So, that's what that's looking like. So, we've got the carrier board here, and then the vision module, and then the sound module. Uh, and I've got a pair of speakers plugged into that. Uh, and I've also got an ESP32. And slightly out of shot, I tip it back. You'll see I've got a Raspberry Pi, which is worth about £5,000 now, because you can't get them. Uh, and uh, a 3D printed robot arm, which has nothing to do with this talk. It's another talk. Uh, and then some bits and bobs. But I've also got um, a 13 amp fuse socket and a lamp. And the lamp's up here. And that's what we'll be uh, controlling in a little bit. 
sure what you meant by that. Thank you. We'll get to that. So actually, I'm going to minimize that. So when you're dealing with the Percept, you'll start out in Azure Percept Studio. Uh, you'll go ahead and you'll register your device, and this is where you'll do most of your work. What's great about this is, is that they've got some pre-built demos and tutorials, so you can go through and you can select things that you want to do. You can try out some sample vision modules here, look, uh, and go and try them out, uh, or some prototypes and vision solutions, and some sample apps here as well for people counting, vision on the edge. Uh, and then we've got our actual device, uh, and you can go into that and find out about the device. I'll deep dive into these in a little minute. Uh, and then we can go to vision and we can have a look at our vision mod uh, uh, models that we've trained here. Uh, I've actually got two, that hammer and screwdriver one there is uh, an old one that I trained a while back. And Percept Vision 1 is what I've actually trained. And if I go to the next tab, this should be, all being well, the live view. There we are. Now, I've trained this to recognize the difference between a hammer and a screwdriver. Only I've not trained it here. And if you've ever trained any of things in custom vision, it also recognizes what's above it. So <laughs> it probably won't be very accurate here. But in theory, if I hold it in just the right space, it might recognize that this is a hammer. Oh. Yeah, the background, you kind of like need somebody with a piece of A4 white paper, and then uh, it probably will recognize it. That might work. You can try it. It's a very busy background, that is. Oh. Oh, that's way too No, don't worry. But trust me, it does work. I'll try the screwdriver look. Oh, 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 see, 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 see. Uh, oh, no, it did it. If we had time, I could actually train it live here, but. I'm on my mobile hotspot, and it'll take about 73 years. So, but you sort of saw that there a second ago, didn't you? Bel you could believe me, that is actually there. And in fact, if you look sort of here, look, that's kind of what it does in real life. But I'm not at home. <laughs> uh, and I couldn't train it earlier because the table was over there, and that's different to here, and that probably wouldn't have worked either. So, yeah, you get the idea, but essentially how that works is you get it to capture live on the device all of the images, and you hold whatever it is you want to hold up in front of the camera, uh, and then you tag them. So if I zoom in just a little bit, you'll see I've tagged a bunch of images here. So these are screwdrivers, and it uploads them directly to the custom vision uh, application that you've created, and you just draw a box around what it is you think it is, and in this case, it's a screwdriver. Uh, and then you tag it as a screwdriver, and you just do that for all of the images. And you're going to need, I don't know, 20 images, really, to start getting any sort of accuracy. Uh, you see the background's pretty plain on there, so there's not much for it to, to go on here. Um, you get what you're given, but it's interesting when, the reason why I did hammer and screwdriver is that, that that looks like a hammer, but if I hold that like that, now what does it look like? Looks like a screwdriver. So there's uh, an MIT data set where they, they put objects out of context, so like chairs upside down on tables and in this case, a hammer on a bed, where it's sort of obscuring part of it. So I was trying to see if I could make that work, but I you know, can't even get it to recognize anything here. But it's all good. Um, but you, uh, you capture all your images, and then you tag them all, and then you can go ahead and train it at the top up here. And you can even test it directly in the browser, if you like. And once you've done that, then you can use the vision side to actually deploy it out to your device. And I've just got six iterations on this, you can see. So you can go through an iterative improvement process for your model and go backwards and forwards between that as well, because you can overtrain as well. And if you're not quite, I mean, if you saw on that previous tab, actually, you can, you've got to be careful, because if you train it on a picture of a hammer, my hand is in that picture. So it can think that every hammer's got a hand. I mean, it hasn't always got a hand. So you do have to be careful of bias when you're training these models. And that's the same for any AI work you're going to do. Um, so, yeah, some of them I was sort of holding it in a different way, and you've just got to bear that in mind whenever you're training these, that it's not always what you're doing that counts. And we saw that with Twitter a while back, if you remember, where it would take 
an image of, of three people from uh, different backgrounds and, and ethnicities, and it would chop out people from uh, minorities, which is a horrible thing to do. But that's the problem with bias if they, with AI. So always bear that in mind and make sure that you de-bias all of your models if you possibly can. As I say, that's not what I really wanted to show you. What I wanted to show you was the, the sound stuff. So if we go across, there's an example that you can just populate into your percept. Um, and it sort of matches up with what it was I wanted to show today um, in home automation. So I can ask it to do things to that room just by speaking to it, theoretically. So I'm going to turn this on and see if it responds back. Controller, turn the television off. OK, turning the TV off. That's pretty cool. Or controller. Controller. Turn the bathroom light off. OK, turning off the bathroom light. So you can see you've got a real fast way of making sure 80% works and the audio side works, but actually contextualizing what it is that you're trying to do. And there's a few examples in that. I'll turn that back off again. There's a few examples uh, that you can try out. If we go back here and go to overview, sample applications. Uh, demos, that's it. So if I click on the voice, you can see there's hospitality, healthcare, inventory, automotive. So a few things that, that Microsoft think that folks would be interested in trying out. And you can take those speech models and you can play with them yourself. Um, so there's some really cool ones that folks have done, actually. I saw one at a Microsoft hackathon where they'd combined the speech and the audio side in an in a, uh, operating theatre scenario where you had the vision looking down at an operating theatre table with all of the uh, instruments on there, and they were able to ask it if any of the instruments were missing. Because that's massively important, because that missing instrument may well be inside your patient. So <laughs> it was a really good use of, of, of how to do that. But I just really want to automate my home. So I'll go back to the slides. Um, I'm going to be using, as I say, the, the audio side of this, the sound module. And what I've got set up is I've got, obviously, the, the sound module with the percept. And then I take that down through their speech services, which I'll show you shortly. And then out to an Azure function. Has anybody used Azure functions before? Good. A few people. So this is, as somebody pointed out earlier, somebody else's computer. Uh, but it's a real great way to be able to host small, or not necessarily small, uh, applications in the cloud. And they're charged down, I think, at the millisecond. So you only really are going to use what you need to use. Uh, and as you see earlier, actually, you're not necessarily even going to get charged. Uh, it's great for IoT, actually, because there are devices that can't necessarily connect directly to an IoT hub. Perhaps they're not powerful enough to do certificates and things like that. But they do have HTTP functionality. So you can trigger an Azure function from an HTTP call, which is exactly what we're doing here. Because even though this is all Microsoft, there's no way to go from Speech Studio directly to an IoT hub. So you have to use a web endpoint. But it works. It's nice. So we can come out of the Azure function, and we can go to an IoT hub, which uh, was mentioned earlier by Bruno. And then we can go out from the IoT hub down to my million pound worth of Raspberry Pi down there, and then to a mains relay, which is sitting in the box, and onto a desk lamp. So pretty simple, but there's a few hops we've got to go through, and software in two of those places, really. So let's see what that looks like. You. Uh, so you saw hospitality, which is great. That's what is deployed down there at the moment. But I need to deploy something else. So what I'm actually going to do is demo it first, and then I'll go through what it looks like and how it works under the hood. So if I go to the speech section in here, we can actually choose different uh, commands. So that's the wake word that we're talking about here. Uh, so at the moment, it's set to that word. If I say it, it'll wake up. So I'm not going to say it. Uh, and in fact, let me just see a little bit. There you are. You might be able to see that a bit better now. Um, so I can program something like that in if I like, and that's you know the Hey Google equivalent. There's something different. So we can click the assign button, 
Um, if, if I'm fast, let's see if I'm going to be fast enough. Let's get that active. Point at the right thing. Let's see if I can be fast enough. So we click assign and then we've got to choose the IoT hub. This is the, 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 the center of the cloud here, essentially. It sits right on the very edge of the cloud. Uh, and it can accept all of the messages and then send messages back out to devices. So it's what called, what's called a cloud gateway. Uh, so that's what's sort of sitting in Azure and working as like a message broker between Azure and the device. So that's my Percept Hub and the Percept One. If I click Save, you might see a blink on those. There we are. That's it down on there. So now it's, it's got a new wake word. And then we have Commands. So at the moment, I've got that demo that I showed you there, the home automation demo working. But I'm going to assign my demo. Assign that. Choose my percept. Should see the same thing again. Should see a blink. There we are. So that's now on there. And then I've also got... Uh, an SSH session, so a terminal session into my Raspberry Pi, and I've got some .NET code, some C-sharp .NET code running on the Pi, and it's sitting there waiting for those hops, and I'll go back through those hops in a minute. But in theory, and you should all be able to see the lamp from here, so I shouldn't need the camera on, but I should be able to go, hey Luke, turn the lamp on. The light has been turned off. See, I, I could do it now, and then if it doesn't work, I've got like 20 minutes to fix it. So, but it worked. It's good. And, hey, Luke. Hey, Luke. Turn the lamp off. The light has been turned off. Oh, there we are. So, how that's working. Uh, I'm just going to show you the slide again. So, we've got the audio module, and that's going through speech services to an Azure function, to an IoT hub, to a Raspberry Pi, and then electrics. Don't kill yourself. It's not good. So let's have a look at the speech services first. And go across here. We have something called a custom command. So this is where, um, uh, cognitive services again and speech studio. So zoom in a little bit, we have to see things a bit more. Uh, we have the idea of sentences, if you like, in a command. So uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the list of commands we've got. And the command that I've just been demoing is this turn light on off command. Within there, we have to define how we expect somebody to say, turn the lamp on, turn the lamp off. And as you can see, there's more than one way to do that. Um, and I've not even included Yoda in there. So you know, turn the light on, or turn the lights, or turn the lamp, or you know, switch on, switch off. And you can also see that I've got if I click just here, we've got a variable. So I could do turn the light on and then turn the light off in a completely separate command, but that's very wasteful, especially when you start getting lots and lots of example sentences. So you have these variables, and with them, parameters as they call them, we get to specify uh, an optional part or uh, a specific part of the sentence that gets dedicated to this particular parameter. And I've got on and off. And you can see down at the bottom down there. Oh, look at that zooming. That was good, wasn't it? That was a huge amount of zooming. You can see that I've got on and off set up down there. There's not much to it. And it's a string. But we get some other meta types there. So we can have date, time, number, geography if we wanted. Um, we could set a default value, but I don't know whether you want it on or off all the time. So I've not got one of them. Uh, and then this accept predefined output values is uh, input values is what I've defined down there. So you have your example sentences, so that trains it exactly how to react to your command. Then you've got the parameters that go into that, and at the end it needs to do something. So you have this concept of a done completion rule. So when it's done, you'll see here that I'm calling in to a web endpoint, and I mentioned that. And this is how we get out to the Azure function. So we've got web endpoints over here on the left. And it just calls into the URL that the Azure function gives you. And you need to post some data to it to tell it, in my case, which device to turn on and off, uh, and whether it's on or off. And that's done 
over here in the done rule. I come in and edit that. I just send it a little bit of JSON with the state and then which device I'm then controlling. So it's pretty simple. There's not a whole heap in there. And once you've done it, you save it, you train it, and then you can go back and you can assign it just like I showed you, and then it appears on the device. So that gives you an idea of what uh, the, the, the cognitive service side of it in Azure looks like. And if we show you a little bit of the code, the code is actually dead simple. Now, what I love about this is it's C-sharp everywhere. So most folks have done C-sharp. Bruno mentioned there earlier, a lot of uh, IoT will be C, and I, I don't like C. It's just difficult, and I definitely don't like it when I'm talking to people that may not have done any IoT at all before, or perhaps not even done C, uh, or to a high enough level. Oh, geez, memory management in C is hard enough. Just let C Sharp deal with all of that. So on, on the Raspberry Pi, I've, I've created a single line install script. Um, uh, if you've just gone on my GitHub or on any of my blogs, you'll see that. And you just run that, and it'll put the full SDKs down on your device, and you're off and running with C Sharp on your Pi. So there's not, there's, I'm not going to deep dive into the code, so I've not got a huge amount of time. But you can see there's not very many lines of code to make that work. Uh, we really just need access to the GPIO, the general purpose input output, the pins on the Pi. Uh, and then we need access to the Azure IoT Hub. And that's it. You just connect up the, the device to the IoT Hub. And then we wait for a command to come in, control light. And when that comes in, if it's on, we turn it on, and if, we, if it's off, we turn it off. Those eagle-eyed folks out there may have spotted it looks a bit backwards, and that's because relays work a bit backwards. You have to take a, an input low or an output low on the, on the relay to turn it on, so it's, it seems a bit backwards, but that's what that is. So that's the, that's the code that's on the Pi, and then we've got the Azure function I mentioned as well. Now, this looks like there's a lot more code in there, but actually, if you've used Azure Functions, when you scaffold an Azure Function out, it'll give you probably 90% of this code. So pretty much everything all the way down to about there, it just gives you all of that. So it all just appears. Um, so you don't need to worry about a great deal of that. But an HTTP call comes in with that body, with the state and the device, and I grab that. And then what I do is I, I do something called a um, direct method call from the Azure function to the IoT hub to say, hey, tell that Raspberry Pi to turn that light on. And then that goes down to the Raspberry Pi code I showed you. And it receives that and says on or off and turns the lamp on or off. So not a great deal of code there to get that all working. And it's all C sharp. But you can go slightly further. If I get the camera back, yeah, it's fine. So here, this is an ESP32, which is a tiny little microcontroller. So um, can anybody tell me the difference between a Raspberry Pi and that device, perhaps? Raspberry Pi is an SOC, like this one is a microcontroller. Perfect. This is a full computer, the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and that's a microcontroller, so there's no operating system on the microcontroller, but there is on the Raspberry Pi. Sort of the basic way to think about it. Raspberry Pi, this one's got 8 gig of RAM and multi-core processor. This tiny little ESP32 down here has probably only got 256k of RAM and a single core, and it's teeny tiny. You try to force a full version, version of C Sharp and all the SDKs onto a device like that, it'll just explode and give up. Um, but uh, folks like uh, Jose Samares have created Nano Framework, uh, and that's a way to be able to make a tiny little version of C Sharp run on a device like that. It's an incredible project, open source, supported by the, um, uh, the Microsoft Foundation um, to be able to help them along with that. Uh, and they've just had their first device certified, actually. It's going to go GA soon. But that means you can now write C Sharp on a microcontroller rather than C, which, you know. Again, C sharp is definitely the way to go. So I've got a version of that same application running on that microcontroller. I don't know if this will work, we'll see. Hey Luke. Hey Luke. I am your father. Sorry. Ah, 
Luke is not here right now. Luke's not here. What's he doing? <laughs> He's got traveling. Hang on. It is. So that's connected to my... Uh, it is connected. He's just not interested. Let me unplug it and plug it back in again, yeah? <laughs> okay. Let's try again. Well, no, it's working because though you might just be able to see there's some blue LEDs and it should just turn off in a second. Oh, don't ruin my demo. Come on, Luke. You can do it. Tell you what, that's cheat. Sort of. This is actually slightly cooler doing it like this anyway. Uh, unplug this, uh, that. Just bear with me a sec. Not everything can work first time. It wouldn't be uh, IoT if it did that. Oh, now it's working. Now I've moved it. Let's try that again. Hey, Luke. Hey, Luke. I am your father. No. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all C-sharp code doing that, though. It's, it's, again, it's not complicated. Oh, and it's, it's busy flashing, but you can't see it now. You can see that. <laughs> it's a silly demo, but... Shush. Uh, but actually, it, it just proves that we can now connect a tiny little device like this over Wi-Fi, and then all the way through an IoT hub, an Azure function, and out to cognitive services. There's lots of hoops that you've just jumped through there, but actually not massively complicated. Um, and we're writing C-sharp rather than C, which, yeah. I've done it. I didn't like it. So. Uh, I can show you that yeah, the code is not particularly difficult. There's more code to the ESP32 version, but actually the majority of it is me setting up notes to be able to play that uh, Imperial March. Um, this will look very similar to what's on the, um, on the Raspberry Pi, and we're literally just setting the connection up to the IoT hub and setting that, the pins up for the LEDs and for the sounder. Uh, and then some threads. I'm not going to deep dive too much. There's the Imperial March look. <laughs> What's great about, um, if you're doing uh, any IoT work uh, in C-sharp, you can get some NuGet packages, uh, device bindings, they're called. Uh, if you've got a full fat C-sharp, those device bindings will just bring down all of the necessary bits of code for you to be able to control about 30 different devices. For something as tiny as ESP32, every byte counts. So you have to download a NuGet package per device. So I've got one for that sounder. A sounder works on something called PWM, pulse width modulation, to be able to get those different sounds that you could hear there. And that's what I've set up in that Imperial March code there. And then look, blink an LED. That's not particularly complicated. Connect to the Wi-Fi. So we didn't have to do that on the Pi because that's just the operating system's handling that for us. Uh, and there's that control light. So that just mirrors pretty much what we had on the Pi. So that could say exact same direct method call that I'm making from the Azure function. That hits the CSP32, and then it starts playing the Imperial March. Uh, and then there's some other boilerplate code in there as well. So with that, I'm back out there, plug my clicker back in again. All of this, you can recreate all of it um, just by following my blog post there at the top. Uh, all of these slides, uh, you'll see there's a link at the end, so you don't need to worry too much about all of those. Caveat with that first one, I did mention electricity can kill your ass, so be careful. Um, but it's a big red box in there, so you know, when you get to that bit, you know, get an adult or, you know, I needed one. <laughs> uh, and then all of the codes in the GitHub just there, so you can go and check that out. Uh, there's some more information about the Percept, speech services, and custom vision there as well. So go ahead and check those things out. Um, myself and a ex-student uh, ambassador, who is now an MVP, Maria Anastasio Mustaka, uh, and uh, strangely, a BA pilot, all run a show called IoT Live. That'll be coming back soon. We just do like a weekly 
news show recap of all the IoT news that, that week. Uh, we've not done it in a little while, one thing and another. Uh, if you'd like to take your learning to another level, we've already spoken about certifications. Um, myself and a few others actually created the AZ220 IoT Developer Speciality Certification, uh, and I keep that thing regularly updated. And I've also created a Pluralsight course to help you pass that exam as well. Uh, so, as mentioned, if you want to you know, get a decent job in IoT, there's definitely a way you can go and do that by passing that certification. It's hard, though, that certification, because it covers a lot of different things. I, the IoT stack covers great swathes of Azure. So, um, yeah, well worth checking it out, though, if you want to learn a lot of Azure. Uh, and then you can contact me at all these different places. Just before I do that, though, if we go over, back over to here... One of the interesting things to bear in mind is that if you start looking at the pricing for all of these things, look. Look. Free. Yeah? That one's free. Let's have a look at the next one. This one is, what's this one? Uh, language understanding. Free. Nice. What's this one? This one is the IoT Hub. What's here, look? Free. And Azure Functions. Um, we get a free grant of many, many, many executions. So you can actually get started with the majority of this for next to nothing. Bearing in mind, Azure Functions needs a storage account, so there's only a little bit of pricing involved in that. But Azure Storage in Blob is mega cheap, so pennies. But I love that, that you, know, you can play with all of this cool stuff. and it, you know, This is the expensive part, but even that, there's simulators for some of this. So well worth going and checking out, won't actually hit your wallet all that hard. Uh, you can grab the slides at that bitly there. I, I uploaded them earlier and changed them since, of course, but you know, pretty much the same. Um, that's actually Pete underscore codes. I must get rid of that, because it, it's, yeah. <laughs> who's, who's got a space in the Twitter handle? That's never going to work. There's another Pete codes, by the way, that hasn't got that underscore, and I'm not him, uh, so don't follow him. Uh, and then you can email me um, if you like, but just use Twitter. Um, I've, all of my blogs are on that um, website there as well. And then, as I mentioned, I run Knots IoT. Uh, we're taking a break over summer, but a monthly IoT meetup. Don't know Knots. Knots Dev Workshop when we go back to in person. Uh, I love Pro-based uh, engineering group. The Agile Engineering Podcast, because I do a bit of DevOps with some friends as well. And that's the Azureish Live channel, which kind of hosts uh, the... Um, uh, IoT live show as well. So that's those. So that's about the only slide you'd need, because that's got that. But you'll also be able to get all of these uh, slide decks from the whole of today will be at that top one. See, look, I've actually put a link on here rather than someone, someone's got to come and press on the screen to click. I think it's that one anyway. But yeah, something like that. I don't, there's no, there's, you'll notice there's no AKA MS for this, because they can't track GitHub with those short links, so they just don't even bother giving you one of them. I nearly made it a bitly, but I thought I got told off, so I didn't. Um, and then uh, Learn Student Hub and Cloud Skills Challenge, definitely go and take that. Um, I don't think you get an AZ220 exam voucher. I think it's for a specific exam, isn't it? The exam voucher, sadly, but do go check that out as well. And with that, that's me done. <laughs>